<laughs> At least I shouldn't enter the house. <clears throat> so, there's two specialty things left in uh, in this in this here, um, and then I'm gonna then, then I'm gonna go and explain to you something else. Um, I have uh, this little wacky expression here that I need to explain to you. So, this guy. What is that? Enterprise, so, so what we're doing here is, this is our web service. This is our web service implementation. The way things are layered are, usually I always have a, have a whiteboard somewhere. Uh, here I don't, so. How do I do this now? Um, let's do it with that. Okay, block diagram, very simple, basic diagram, that's enough. So, um, I have a web service, that font, slightly better font. Okay? I have web service. The web service is exposed to, to, to the outside. I have an enterprise service service component which is sitting sort of inside my process, right? So here's my enterprise service service component. No, no, Whitehorse doesn't. With Whitehorse, for instance, I cannot model enterprise service service components. It's an omission, they say. <laughs> They say we didn't have time. We didn't have time to include. Oh, that's thank you for the feedback. Exactly. <laughs> they didn't have time to include the primary application server technology of the Windows platform into Whitehorse, <coughs> which is purely interesting. So this this here is our uh, enterprise services process, right? Um, and. Uh, that here is our IIS process. The enterprise services process. The enterprise services process gives us process stability, right, and the ability to start on demand. Meaning, I can start my message queue listener on demand. So now I need to have a way, and our primary way to communicate is, make no make no mistake, ASP.NET Web Services. This is the primary way of communicating between between our services. Um, I'm using enterprise services you purely for the process model capabilities, and then I need to have a way to get into the, the uh, into that uh, process. And for that, I'm using service components. I'm using service components only on machine. Right? Everything, every traffic goes across machines. Happens either through web service calls or in in exceptional cases through MSMQ. Um, I've actually modeled it in a way that I'm using a local queue and I'm fronting it with the web service and I'm going to explain that's the other specialty I want to explain to you um, in this first uh, 15 minutes and then I'm going to uh, explain to you a few things about Indigo. So, so in this special scenario, in, in the usual scenario, in the simple scenario, I would simply be hosting my classes inside, uh, inside IIS I would be calling my internals, I would be doing all the database stuff, and all of these things happen in IS in the application pool. Here in this spe special case, I have this enterprise services co service component which lives in this process. So I need to cross this boundary, right? And I'm crossing this boundary using a connection between my web service and my enterprise services service component. That's typically done by saying new service component, service component dot function call and done. Or you say using class equals new class and then you make that call. That turns out not to be performing all that well. Um, when people use, and you can go back in time forever and read, doc and read the documentation, read MSDN articles, read articles you know, everywhere. And what they tell you about VB6 apps, for instance, and what they tell you also about .NET apps is if you use Enterprise Services or if you use COMPLUS, always use your COMPLUS components in process because it's 
incredibly expensive to go across the process boundary. It turns out that this guidance is completely untrue and unfounded. Because you can make a call across the process boundary on the same machine almost as fast as an in-process call. Because Enterprise Services and Complus use a local protocol that every single of your application uses to communicate with the Windows kernel components and with any other of the Windows, uh, Windows components. The programmable stuff that you have in Windows runs inside these puppies, inside the service hosts, amongst other things. Right? There's services, they're programmable, there's an API for them, you can link them locally and you make local calls. Those local calls are relayed by using a protocol that's called LPC, the Local Procedure Call Protocol. It is sort of like a RPC protocol, right? Remote Procedure Call versus Local Procedure Call, but there's marshalling taking place. The marshalling that's taking place uh, works, and unfortunately I can't really draw this all, so I have to tell you and do that slowly. You're making, you're making any procedure call into a kernel method. Kernel runs in its own threads, run in, runs in its own process space, right? So you have to pass, if you have to pass parameters, there's marshalling taking place. The marshalling between processes on the same machine is done by placing the marshaled version of whatever you pass it into shared memory. Shared memory is memory mapped files. And the shared memory that the that the, uh, that the kernel, or Windows uses in general, is the page file. The page file is necessary, you must have a page file on, with a Windows NT, or Windows Sub 2000, or Windows XP, because that provides you with shared memory. And that's memory map files. Memory map files work like this. You have um, a file, and a view of that file is mapped into memory. It looks like memory. If you're accessing that memory location, you're actually writing into that file. So all that is backed by the file. If two processes, and if two processes look at the same location in that file, they can map the same view into their memory space. Sometimes, so, and that's, you have the file underneath, and you have the system cache that sits on top of this, right? And then you have those memory pages which sort of sit on top of the cache, sit on, sit on top of the memory file. When you have a page fault, when you have a page fault, a page fault means it's nothing bad. A page fault means that you're hitting a page which is currently not mapped into memory. And then the operating system goes down into the, into the underlying backing file and lifts that up into memory. And after some time, when you haven't hit the page for a while, it just discards that memory and you're falling back to the memory store, and then it writes that back. That's, that's what that means. So that's how shared memory is working. LPC takes whatever call you make and sticks this into shared memory so that the called process can take it straight out of, out of shared memory. So instead of an RPC call where you go and stick it into, into the TCP stack, Right? It goes through the buffer, goes through the transport, goes through the network stack, blah, 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 and comes out on the other side. You simply put it into a shared, play, shared place, and the other process can take it out of a shared place. That's fact one. Fact two is that if you're using LPC, you're calling this on your own thread. Right? You're just calling an API. The API then goes into the Windows, into the Microsoft RPC stack, which is something that's sort of hidden inside, which you could program yourself if you wanted to, and if you were willing to program C or C++. And what happens then is that your thread is tunneled into the kernel mode. In kernel mode, every thread is able to traverse process boundaries, goes into the other process, surfaces back into application mode, and then executes that call in the other process, picking up that shared memory package. And then it comes back. So on your, on your time slice that you get as on your thread, on your process, you're tunneling into a different process, executing something there, and you come back on your time slice. That's how LPC works. LPC works, LPC is done by, by the kernel, LPC is done by COM and DCOM on the same, on the same machine. That's basically what the HTTP 
does in IAS6. Exactly. HTTP sys does that too. HTTP sys owns the threads, and those threads sort of tunnel into, into IAS. And that's, that's the difference if you guys have learned uh, all you know about operating systems uh, using Linux or Unix. That's a different story. That's process-based. In, in, in Unix or Linux, threads are an artifact created on a single process. There's no concept, there's no native concept in those operating systems of threads. So threads are created sort of in the process space, but threads cannot tunnel through processes. In Windows, Windows is a multi-threaded operating system where threads are a first-class construct of the operating system, and processes are just empty address spaces. And threads go and tunnel through this, through this process space, and can go through this process space, so they, they can tunnel through all those things. LPC is using this capability. That being said, every time you make a DCOM call, you can, on the same machine, you can use this, L, this LPC capability, or you automatically using this LPC capability. However, COMPLUS is a very, very complicated, massive infrastructure. You have, we have transactions, we have security, we have all those capabilities which can be switched on. If you look at all these capabilities, and look at the app, right? Now we're looking at this application, one of ours, catalog service, right? And the catalog service itself has security settings, has identity settings, has activation settings, has queuing capabilities, has logging and all sorts of things. All these need to be handled. Each component has capabilities like transaction support, security support, special activation support, concurrency support, and all those things. And someone needs to do those things. Every, all of these capabilities are injected in your call when you make that call. When does that happen? When you, make, when you try this at home, right, I suggest that you go and time the construction of a new, of a service component versus the actual call time that you make when you're executing something on the service component. The result is you'll be shocked. Because constructing the service component takes a long time. Doing the call is very quick. So you have two lines of code where you thought that the new is cheap and the call is expensive, which is not true. It, it, the reverse is true. Because you need to go and you need to look up in the COMPLUS catalog, is this, is this is, and that's a database lookup, is this uh, component configured? Where is it configured? You need to go to the other process side, probably to the other machine. You need to look up in the COMPLUS catalog for the server policy, because they may differ. You need to construct this. Then you need to cons uh, construct a series of policies, which are all COM objects. Policy means these are the interceptor stages, which will, as the call passes in, create the transaction, which will then close the transaction as you come out. These are all objects which are created for your connection. It is very expensive to build those things. One new creates 20 objects, easy, on different machines even. It is very expensive. When we're saying expensive, it takes a few milliseconds. What do we do with databases? We do connection pooling because logging into a database is likewise very expensive. Since with .NET we live in MTA land, everything is multi-threaded, right? And with VB6 we live in the horrible STA land. STA land is like the line in front of the ladies' toilet, right? There's limited resources. And therefore, everybody's queuing up, and the limited resources are the threads that are able to execute those components. With multi-threading, let, don't let me continue that picture. But it's easier, right? Because everybody can do whatever they want. There's no restriction. There's no limited threads, and you don't have to put everybody on their own thread. All that management goes away. Therefore, you can create a component. You can create, more precisely, a connection to a component and let that live. So, what I build is a little pool. And that's this class with a horrible name, which I'm going to post on my blog um, in the upcoming weeks. I can't, I probably won't do this Christmas, but I'll do this, so not next week, but towards the end of next week, with more explanation. So here I have a just-in-time activation proxy pool. What this does is it's caching the proxy. 
So you walk up to this thing, you say, I want to have a service component, and it's going to give you, give, give you one. More precisely, it's going to give you a proxy, plus all this goo in the middle, with a connection towards the server, only without the server component on the other end. Because that's the quality of just-in-time activation, that gives you this entire setup, but the component at the end is missing. If you if you reason if you create it first, then the component is there. So this this pool locally caches proxies. So what I'm doing once I have those proxies, I can simply say, "Give me one," I execute on it, and I put it back into the pool. And this saves all this construction time that I would typically do when I say new. I would, every time you say new object, you create the connection. You create all these things, you, you incur all this time. Pooling those components locally on the, on the client means that this work is already done. You keep 20 of those component, component stuffs around. Yes? Object pooling, how is it right? This Object pooling is a server side thing. We're, we're combining those things. Okay? So this is the client side thing, and I, this, is, this is something that I, I, that I built. To use this effectively, so this is the, the proxy pool. This has two methods that matter. One is pop. And this is taking one out. And I'm actually using a special, I'm using a fixed size array. I'm using interlocked um, for synchronization, which is a assembly, a machine level construct to, um, to, to avoid locking. Because I, don't want, I, want, I don't want to give up my thread. Interlocked is a processor built-in thing which the operating, operating system is agnostic about. If you use any of the higher level constructs, um, like, uh, law, uh, like, um, mu uh, like mutexes, thank you for starting me, critical sections, any of those things, and you run into a lock, right? You run into a lock situation, your operating system thread will be, your time slice will be taken away from you from the operating system. I don't want that. So, because I just want to exchange a value and test the value, I use interlock, which is done on the processor level, so the operating system won't, not, won't, won't notice this. So, if I can't find anything in my pool, I'm just creating a new instance. So, I'm creating that off the pool. Then I push, and push puts it back into my pool. And that's... I'm just putting it back, and if the pool is overflowed, so if I have, have, if I have not, not enough slots, and the standard is 64, um, then I'll just throw the, let the component go away. Okay? And then you would have to write this thing. If we are in the transaction, then the context, the component actually has the transaction affinity, then we can't use this mechanism. So you would have to use, you would have to create the component yourself. Otherwise, you go and say pop, and you say push. And then, if you get the following exception, RPC call, call failed DNE, which means the call failed and, but did not execute, which means that the proxy is stale. Right? The, the, proxy, the server has meanwhile been stopped and been restarted, so your proxy, which has process affinity, has died, so it's no longer usable. So what I'm doing then is I'm creating a new one and replacing the one that I popped in the pool, but I'm, I'm executing the call. So in order so that you don't have to write all this code, all this stuff in your on the application level, I created this little using method. And the using method is getting a delegate. And using the feature anonymous delegates of uh, C Sharp, what I'm doing now is this, where I'm saying jitter pool using, right? And I'm writing an inline delegate right here, and I can go and load and use, and that's the advantage of that, and use the local variable here straight in my anonymous method. So I'm hiding this wrapper, which calls this method probably three times in different circumstances. I'm, I'm hiding that, and I can, I can pass the local variable straight, straight in here. And with that, I have a proxy pool, which massively increases my performance. My, our customers have measured that once they've started using this trick, 
they're seeing 500, 700% increases in, in the enterprise services component performance. Just because they're saving all that activation time. Activation time is massive. So and this is the way I'm, I'm, cross, I'm traversing the boundary. Why did I talk, talk about LPC? Because it turns out that if you use that trick, you can, you can see, and we've done measurements, and we were puzzled about the results, you can see that I can actually execute, if you don't hit the disk, which is a super expensive thing, but if you were just calculating stuff, right, just adding a few numbers, um, that you can execute a cross-process call using enterprise services within your thread time slice. It is very, very fast. So, so there's, you know, forget the myths about this stuff being very expensive. You can use that trick. You will find that on my blog. I'm going to give you the blog address um, at the very end. Remind me that I do. Okay. So this is just the time activate. This is just, just the time activation proxy pool, and this is a way to take a take a code pattern, formulate out this code pattern, and then have user code called at several places. It's called anonymous methods, and you basically define the delegate here. That's the delegate and this handler that I'm using. This is where I'm defining it. This takes this component type, and then you construct a compatible delegate using this ex expression. The return value is inferred, and then you can call this code. Um, I can also I can also use this in more complex settings. Let's say whether uh, let's see whether I, I find one case uh, where I have let's see oh, oh, where I'm breaking where I'm actually breaking this up. No, I can't find one. Okay, but you, that's the, so that's the, so if I had the local variable declared here, or anything around this call, I could use those local variables easily within, within that delegate. That scope is preserved. Don't ask me how they do that, but it works. Okay, so this is how I take this pattern and just map this pattern into my, into my code here. It looks slightly wacky, right, using and then doing the delegate, and this looks a little sick, but sick looking doesn't count, it works well. That's trick one. Trick two, uh, the other thing that I'm doing is um, in the order fulfillment service as well, in the web service, I'm accepting data through the message queue, and I can accept data through the message queue in two ways. I can, you can simply throw it into the message queue, using the exact same data structures, the exact same message structures that we defined in contract. So, on the reading side, here's our listener. This is the message available handler that I showed you earlier. If we go scroll down to see that, I'm looking at the message label of the incoming message. If that is corresponding to one of the methods I have on my service components, and I'm just making those strings up, right? And that's my action, if you will. Then I'm taking our contract fulfill order message, the message that we set that we've defined in contract. This is just my personal message queue binding at this point. And then I'm creating a new instance of the service component, and I'm just taking the message queue body the body of the message queue message, and throwing this into the service component as a parameter. That's the second reason why I'm using structures, because you can take those structures and simply throw them into a queue. You can throw them on disk. You can pass them as parameters to, through a method, and there's always the same structure. With a parameter list, you could do this. But with a message structure, you can't. You need to make, make, sure, make sure that the, the type inside is Inside the structure are simple types because of, of the universal marginal that, that MSMQ uses. No, no, MSMQ uses the XML message formatter. This is all text. For that, message queues in two components. Yeah, but that's not okay. two components. Okay. This is just this is using okay. this is using the XML message formatter, so it's all flat text. Okay. okay? 
and XML message format is the default for the managed MSMQ implementation. It's, it's by default, it's always XML. You have to set the X, ActiveX formatter for the, univer the not quite so universal Russian one. <laughs> okay, so this is how I'm pulling this, this is how I'm pulling this out of MSMQ. Um, the message, the message listen, the message queue listener, which is in here, is a very. I would love to show you all of that, um, but I have a very simple message queue listener, which is, has the blessing of our super MSMQ expert, uh, uh, which he said this this thing from yesterday was so good. I'm using it in my projects now. So uh, you're going to get this. Uh, I gave this to Microsoft, and you're going to you're going to get it all. It's going to be made available. The little sample that I wrote yesterday, which is implementing most of those patterns, right? I, I wrote this live yesterday, so I, but I'm showing you the, the big app. Um, so the, here's the message available thing. Now, my constraint for this app is that I really, really want to not to, com to communicate with MSMQ across the service boundary. Interoperability issues, blah, 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 and now the MSMQ expert will say, hey, we can do HTTP with MSMQ, but the point is, it's still MSFQ. And it's using the SOAP, R, SOAP RP protocol, which is the SOAP reliable messaging protocol, which wasn't widely adopted. That's right. See? So, so I'm, prox I'm doing a special trick to get cute messages in front of my service. And that is very simple. In my web service implementation, locally, which sits here, I'm throwing the message into, guess what? A queue. This is how, compli how complicated that is. Implement service, new message queue, create the new message, create the new formatter, and simply throw the incoming message, incoming message body as it is into the message queue, and then pull it out on the other side. <coughs> so what I'm doing here is you make a synchronous message, message a synchronous call, you drop the message in. I'm saving it locally on disk, more or less, right? because I'm putting it into MSFQ, and therefore I have a queue in front of my app. And now I have a bunch of threads which spin locally and pull all that data that comes from the outside into my application, but on my own time. There can be an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary stress coming from the outside. There can be literally as many, as many calls as my, web service, as my web stack and as my IP stack can handle on that given machine. And none of this will overstress my application because my application just pulls 60 threads at a time uh, messages from the message queue on its own time. Right? Some of them will be idle if there's not much traffic, but if there's a lot of traffic, there's a maximum number of pro concurrent processes that are running and not more. That's the benefit of using a queued application, of using a push-pull translation. That's, that's what I'm doing here. Okay. There's a specialty here. And the specialty lies in the contract. This is clearly a one-way operation. There's no output. Yet, this is one-way false. One-way true and one-way false means that there may be, so sometimes there may be a result, sometimes there may be none. If I say one, if I say one way true, I'm controlling two things. I'm controlling, first of all, whether a reply message is being sent. In general, there's always a reply message being sent, and that's 200 okay, because we're using HTTP, right? So there's always something coming back. So basically controlling how much is going to be called, it's going to be sent back, whether there's an empty envelope or just nothing. That's the first thing I'm controlling. The second thing I'm controlling is how that, how that call is being dispatched. If I say one way true, ASP.NET will take this call and, and dispatch it onto the .NET thread pool and execute it on the thread pool thread. If I said one way false, it's going to execute, and anything that happens in that thread right, is not going to come back anywhere. If I execute this on, uh, if I say one way False, it's going to be executed on the IIS thread, which is the interesting distinction. What I want is I want no answer. 
But what I want to do here explicitly is if that sending into that queue fails, I want this thing to bubble an exception back to the client. I want this thing to fail. I want the client to know that this isn't, didn't work. If, if everything goes well, it's all fine. We know we have the data safely in the queue. If it doesn't go well, well then the client knows that it has to resend the message. This operation here is very, 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 very short and very, very fast. If I can, if I can at all reach the client, so I don't get a network exception, right? That means not getting a network exception means I can't reach the client. If I don't get that, then it's likely because the, the risk exposure for network failure is very small because this operation is very fast, if I can get there, I can likely also get back. The risk exposure is slow because my operation is fast. If I can at all establish a connection, it's likely that, I, that that one package, which is going to flow back, will also come back. It's not 100% guaranteed at all, right? But it's, 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 a, it's a bet, it's a gamble. It's a reliability gamble that I'm playing. But it's very likely that it's, that it's going to be so. If I was executing this synchronously, then of course, the, the wider the time window is, the wider it is the the bigger is the risk for network failure for your response. So I'm keeping this intentionally, keeping this very, very small, but just dropping it straight into the message queue. And this is not as good as reliable messaging, but it's reliable enough for my purposes here. It's okay, because I have a small exposure, risk exposure window for things failing. If I can reach it, it's likely that stuff works. And so if the, mess if the local message queue service is down, inconsistent, anything, anything bad, I'm going to get a result and say, sorry, you can't submit. Of course, the better way would, would be to go and just submit it in your local message, into, locally into a distributed message queue, and then let MSMQ do the network transfer. But that's not always an option. With the way I've implemented message queuing here, you can do both, right? You can drop it into a message queue, route it to the application, it will pull it locally. Or, and I just reconfigure the queue, or I can drop them off at this web service and I have both, I have them both ways. Okay? So these are ways how you can use the existing stack for integrating nicely um, all those services. I have enterprise services as an option if you need the service, if you need to have a stable process model, if you need things like transactions. Your default model is ASP.NET, which you should which you should always use as a default, that's what you start with. Um, the best way to manage the code is probably not to use ASP.NET projects, but really use class libraries, so you have, have it all nicely in one place, and then link them using these AS, ASMX files into your application. Even though the, 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 the IDE doesn't do that directly, that seems like the most reasonable pattern to me. MSMQ can be nicely integrated using this pattern, this, this pattern by you reusing the same messages and the same message bodies that you have in your contract and just flow them around and you can mix and match between uh, those methods and you can use them nicely for one-way operations and, and uh, situations where you need to buffer in front of your application. You're actually using MSMQ to connect with the edge and the internal. Yes. Uh, what, what about using uh, MSMQ in the WSIS scenario for using it on the edge and outside? Uh, in, in, a WSI, in a what scenario? Using, using WSI. Yes. Uh, and, and then using MSMQ as a transport. Yes. Yeah. And using using WSI and using MSMQ as a transport. I've um, I have the I have the strong intent. We have a we have a pr pretty big treasure tr uh, treasure treasure chest of stuff and intelligence, um, which still sort of needs to be documented. And we actually have extensions like this. There is one extension floating around um, somewhere out in the wild. I'm not sure whether I've published mine any, uh, at any point in time. It, it could be that I've published it. I have to look it up. Um, but I'll, if I haven't, I intend to put that into my blog before I leave, right? Um, because I'm probably the only one to be able to explain it right. Uh, but we have an, an MSMQ transfer for WYSI. That's a reasonable option to use WYSI and then use MSMQ as an alternate transport. It, one way, that's no problem. Two-way, you have to start doing correlation, and that's a little difficult, but I've done that too. No, 
the problem is just to start blocking, and MSQ doesn't like the blocking. You need to really receive by correlation ID, which is a bad thing. No, we're really thinking about using it for a uh, sort of a, a publish uh, scenario, a publishing scenario from uh, yeah, so the fan it out. Yes, yes, and that's that's perfectly reasonable to do that. There is one published. Maybe you publish it. There. I know. I know that there's one published. Um, um, a guy who wrote so for the, the one-way scenario, you can find it. I believe it's a code project. Yeah, I think. Okay, so th that's a wonderful thing. You grab it, take it, harden it for your enterprise use, and then use it. It's a good thing. All right. So we've covered enterprise services. We've covered ASP.NET Web Services. We've covered the MSMQ all in one model. Um, and the code that you uh, can get from Microsoft Israel contains all those things. There's one more technology called remoting. Remoting is embedded, in, uh, embedded into enterprise services. In fact, the calls that enterprise services make are all remoting calls, which are tunneled through DCOM. Remoting as a standalone technology is a dangerous path because it gives you all of the features of the CLR and makes you think they're all good to, to, good to use across the network. Remoting is the counterexample for service-oriented architecture. It is the example for super tight coupling stuff, um, and therefore highly discouraged to use between any two processes, either on machine or off machine. It is the proper way and the only way to couple between application domains inside the same process. So if you need to spawn an application domain for some reason, for instance, if you want to load assemblies dynamically, and you have a long running process, you want to load an extension into your process, and you want to get rid of it later, you need to create an application domain. Because there's a load assembly function on the app domain, but there's no unload assembly. Because it would be damn difficult to do that. So instead, you create an application domain, you have a little bridge that you create a component inside that application domain called with the with the function uh, create instance or create instance and unwrap on the application domain. So you create sort of a bridge head inside the other application domain. The other application domain goes and creates whatever it needs, loads assemblies, does its work, and then you throw in, throw away the entire application domain uh, and that unloads the assemblies with it. That's one of the reasons why we would want to have another application domain. Since your, your app or your default domain and the application domain need to communicate in some way, that's done automatically using remoting. So it's using the cross, the cross app domain channel, which is automatically created for you. If you reach, if you say create instance on the app domain, you create an object on the other side, you automatically have a transparent proxy and remoting and etc. all between them. And that's a good use of remoting. Because in that, there you are in the object world, you need all those things. For going across the network, no, no. Between processes, no, no. It's, that's not, that's, that's what, people, what people are using remoting for, but the people who own remoting highly discourage that from being done. So that's why I'm not showing you. I have instances where I personally use remoting, and these are the exact ones that I just talk, talk, talked about, app domains. And that's what they're fine for. So I wish I would I would be able to cover uh, more of all these things, but uh, I have 20 minutes left, and uh, I am required to, by myself and by Microsoft, to show you something else. <coughs> and so I shall do. Remember, if you. If you keep in mind all the concepts that I just talked about, you'll find that the next thing that I'm going to show you is rather familiar. It's just a little easier. I'm going to create a little component. And I'm actually going to put this into the proper directory. Uh,
Who am I? Who am I targeting with you guys? <clears throat> so here we have a little here we have a little application, um, and. Uh, now, all this complication aside, we want to, I want to build an Indigo service, okay? So now we're entering the wonderful world of WCF. Add um, <coughs> reference, in fact. Interface, I update customer. Uh, for that, I need to have a class, which I'm going to leave intentionally end. Well, I'm just going to put one field in this. And I forgot another assembly. I need to have a special assembly. System dot runtime dot serialization. These are always to go together. System dot service model and system dot runtime dot serialization. System dot runtime dot serialization is the new serialization model that will come with Indigo. And uh, system dot service model, from which service contract stems, is the new is from system dot service model, and that's your new best friend. Customer gets a string property. Let's say, we'll make that a name. And to, to expose that name to the wire, we're going to make that a data member. That's very similar to the things to the things that we've, oh, data contract was going to be, sorry. Oops. So, um, to, ex to, expose, to expose objects on the wire, we have been set, we have been, we had serializable, we had all the XML attributes before, right? Here's the third way. That's the new way. With, you, can, you can create a lot of harm with writing pure XSTs. You could create less harm, but still some harm, with using the XML attributes. With data member and data contract, you can't create no harm because it has almost no switches. <coughs> It is a very simple model and it always does elements. It doesn't even let you do attributes. It is very, very simple. It is built so that Indica can do the right thing for interoperability. It keeps things damn simple. If you're, you can use either the XML, the XML attributes, right, XML serializer, or this new uh, so-called XML formatter, uh, which is simpler, which is making interoperability work. And they're just doing the right thing for you. So, Data contract, data member. Here's our customer. Um, now I'm going to define the interface. I'm just going to say update customer. And what I'm leaving out is the message class, which I could still define. In fact, would still define. I'm just leaving it out for, for to keep this a little compact so that I don't have all those classes sitting here. And because I already have a data structure, so that's just fine. I can use any type of signature, but I like the one parameter thing. Um, and this is a, an operation contract. So up until here, we're sticking to the, the interface paradigm, so the thing that I explained to you, the data, the data member, the data structures paradigm. The only thing that changes is its different attributes. In fact, additional attributes. Because we've been using the same classes but with enterprise service and with web service in the same way, and also with MSMQ, right? Because I designed them with interfaces, with messages starting right there. That's my idea of contract. Here, I can do the same thing. I can reuse them. I could actually go and use those attributes on the same structures, just side by side with with all the other technologies. In my example that I that I copied, uh, I actually did that. 
So, and now I am going to implement this. So let's build the update customer service. For which I'm implementing <coughs> that very interface. There we go. And this is just a, a mock-up. It's not going to do anything. Right? And that's just a, that's just a plain old normal class. It's nothing special to it. It just implements an interface. <coughs> And otherwise, it's doing nothing special. Now we're going to turn that thing into an Indigo service. Turning that into an Indigo service is fairly simple. You always need to, you only need to remember three things: A, B, and C. It's like Sesame Street. Think Ernie. Think Bird. Think Big Bird. It's always the same thing, A, B, and C. What you need is an address, a binding, and a contract. Address is the where, binding is the how, contract is the what. A, B, C. If you remember A, B, C, you know how to program Indigo. A, B, C. So, here's my service host. The service host hosts object of type update customer, that's easy enough, right? The service host is the thing that runs and listens for messages. Now, that's not, that's not really true. It's the host that hosts the things that run to receive messages. The things that, that, that run are called listeners, and they listen for endpoints. And what do they need to work? They need to have an address, they need to have a binding, and they need to have a contract. Unless, unless remoting or enterprise services where you put in the class and it just exposes woo, everything that thing has, here now you say, ah, you explicitly need to put the contract on the wire, explicit boundaries. Okay? So we're going to do that. <coughs> Update customer host dot at service endpoint. And now we need to have an A and B and a C. Let's start with the C. Type of I update customer. That's our contract. C, we need to have a binding. And we're going to pick a binding. We're going to pick a pre-built one. We're going to say, let's say we're going to use the basic HTTP binding. Basic HTTP binding, which, it, which essentially means that we're going to use the one, the HTTP SOAP 1.1 binding that is defined in the basic profile, and that's the same thing that ASP.NET uses. Okay? And now, the third thing what we need, we need to have an address, so we're going to say, we're going to host this on localhost 808 or 8080, uh, 8080 is dangerous on my machine, uh, 8096 slash and now I'm going to say update customer host dot open. I'm going to say console dot right line press exit. Oh no, press enter to exit. <laughs> it's time for me. It's pretty stressful. So, and I'm closing this. When I run this, there will be something listening, and in my particular build that I'm using here, and because I'm doing something horribly wrong, my machine is will not survive the next three, day, three days, at least, at least the windows on it. This reads, requires a reinstall. I'm going to get a 500, most likely. Yep. But that shows, the fact that I'm getting 500 means something is listening, okay? I should be getting a whistle <coughs> file, which I'm not getting because something is majorly messed up on this box. I'm very sorry that it is. It actually works. You can write apps, but you simply can't get whistle. I 
at least not at least done this way. I'm very sorry about that. So this is so what I've done now is I've written an Indigo service which acts exactly like an ASP.NET web service. You couldn't see it, but you need to believe me. Now I'm going to add the capabilities of remoting or enterprise services to it, and that is I want to have binary transfer, super fast, super, super fast, in the order of DCOM, right? Um, that does put all the angle brackets on the wire, but a very compact binary format through a TCP channel. The fun is I can add that in parallel. <laughs> Update customer host, add service endpoint, type off, I update customer, on the same service, at the same time, I'm going to say net TCP binding, unconfigured, I'm going to say you are listening to net.tcp, and I can specify whatever I like, local host, let's say 8097 slash UPD. And so we're running it. It's starting. The Windows Firewall is a wonderful demo to it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, it has started listening, listening now to TCP with a super fast binary transport, which serializes info sets, XML, onto the wire, but in a completely different format. It's using something that's very similar to what DCOM uses in terms of the technique. There's, there's marshalling tables on both ends, and the tags, if you will, don't cross the wire. Just, just the payload goes up across the wire. This dictionary transfer, it's, it's sort of the mix between the network data representation stuff that's used by, by DCOM and Huffman encoding. Right? That's what happens on the wire here. It's not interoperable with anything but Indigo. But we have an interoperable endpoint sitting right here. So since this is a one-way thing, Right? I could say update customer host, add service endpoint, type off. I update customer, comma, new, net, MSMQ binding. Ha <laughs> ha! And I can go and uh, listen to net dot MSMQ, whack whack, oops, whack whack, um, localhost, slash, private, dollar, UPD, or I can listen to public queue too. And all of a sudden the service listens to an MSMQ queue with all the transaction support you want and all those things, and it's all one service. I've done a lot of work. Right? To build an infrastructure that does all those things, that unifies all those things. And it, well, what means infrastructure? I've done a lot of work to structure an application in a way that suits all those different styles. I've written an application that has it its own message queue listener that's robust because there's no built in one. Uh, and I don't need this. In Indigo, it's all just there. So. Now this thing is listening to MSMQ. This I'm going to comment out because I don't have that queue. So it's rightfully going to bark at me. Um, so now I can say, look, now we have binary transport, HTTP transport, MSMQ transport. If you want to build your own transport, if I want to build, oh, I can listen to name pipes, which is the best in, in process transport. It's very, very fast, right? Name pipes plus binary. That's damn fast. They're going to have an IPC transport eventually as well, not, in the, not for the first release. Now I'm going to say, look, this operation as implemented shall do something special. It has an operation behavior, and that says, hmm, transaction scope required. Transaction autocomplete? Yes, please. So please, if you open the transaction, then close that transaction if you exit. And transaction scope required. True. And that does the same as enterprise services with its transaction attribute. Might that 
this transaction attribute is now not sitting on the class, it's sitting on the operation level. If I want to give that service a special, service a special behavior, I can go and say, well, do we want to have session support or uh, automatic uh, session support I can specify on the contract? Of course, it has to be. But here I can specify all sorts of different uh, things like the instant context mode. Right? Instant context mode would mean, um, like in remoting, it's a single call or a single thing. Right? I can set that. I can set instant context mode here for this particular instance is per call, that's single call, or per session. That is like a, that is that keeps it up for the duration of the entire session, or is it a single? So I can control the behavior, and this works with any transport. Now comes the fun bit. All of that here, all that code, you can write. But that's not really your business, is it? It's not your business deploying an app and figuring out what the best path is to communicate. You want to ha you have a service that you have living in your, in your application. You know that. But you don't know what the network topology is of, of a given deployment. You don't really know what the, what, the, what, the, what the network boundaries look like. You don't know what the, what the ports are that are available, et cetera, et cetera. Why not leave that up to the deployment people? And I do. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a config file. In that application configuration file, I'm going to say, all right, we're going to have a service. <coughs> I can hardly type. We're going to have a service. And that service is of type. Console host dot update customer. And guess what? It has endpoints. What do we need? Address, binding, contract. Address is HTTP, localhost. And localhost, of course, placeholder for any IP address the machine can have, or you can narrow it down to a specific one. You can also say plus, that means all local ones, and star means all external visible ones. 8096 slash UPD and the binding is the basic HTTP binding and the contract is console host dot oops dot I update customer I can hardly type it anymore I think it will fall asleep and once you do this, once you have the configuration in place, you run it. And again, we get the expected fault, which signifies that it works. We get an HP 500, where we should imagine there would be wisdom coming, right? It's the same, you know, it doesn't work now, does it? And now I've configured this application. Now I've done, didn't, I didn't do this imperatively, I've configured this app. If I want to host an additional TCP endpoint, it's not too much of a big deal, right? I go and say, oh, whoop, whoop, <coughs> dot TCP, localhost, different port. Let's make it a totally different port so that it will prompt us again. And we say net TCP binding, like that, run it. listening to that address as well. So all happens for 
Now, if you say, ah, but the basic, you can tell me a lot about those things with the basic bindings, but how do I modify the bindings? But if you need to tweak stuff, you say, all right, you say you make binding section, you say, okay, I want to tweak my settings. So you say the basic HTTP binding uh, here, and I want to create a special binding. Um, then you give, it, give that thing a name, uh, my version. Right? my binding version. And on that binding version, you have a lot of options. You could, for instance, specify uh, the message encoding that you want. And the message encoding would be UTF-16, because you have special requirements. Or it could be, let's take something more sensible, the send timeout in milliseconds, I believe. Right? Sending back things. And you could also receive timeout and all those things. You name them. And then you go, fine, and the binding configuration, you simply reference here, say, that's my version. And so you can tune all those bindings to whatever you need. You can go in the binding itself, open, and have, for instance, a security node. And then you can specify all the security things that you want. So you can set the security mode here to, for instance, Windows and Kerberos and all those things. So you can config configure in detail all those bindings, and if those bindings are not sufficient, all this tweaking is not sufficient, you can build your own. And if and if all the transports are not enough, if the way Indigo writes messages onto the wire is not enough, you can change that all too. So finally, to close, let me, let me open a little different app. Uh, if I manage to find it, there it is. <coughs> Hoping that it will not disappoint me. Um, that's an app that I'm writing, so for my own purposes, I can't show you, I can't really demonstrate how that works. Uh, because I don't have network, and that requires network. However, I can show you this little app. <coughs> and I actually need to cheat. I need to look at the conference to see. I need to see what I'm hosting here. So I have configuration, I have my own custom binding in this case, and I'm actually injecting my own stuff into this binding. So I built an extension for the config model, and that's not so hard. I'm currently documenting it on my blog, how that works, and I'm using the HTTP transport in a naked fashion. And I'm not throwing soap messages onto the wire, I'm throwing other stuff onto the wire. Under local host 8020, I'm hosting or that. Mind that all the images and all the CSS files and all the JavaScript and all that stuff, right, is pulled through an Indigo channel and all that stuff really works. <laughs> Except that IE dies, right? That's an Indigo application. It's a web server built with Indigo. Indigo is still. Works faster than IIS. Yeah, it actually eats the shit out of IIS. <laughs> um, building, so I, if Indigo is so extensible that I'm, instead of Indigo by default is soap, sending soap on books, right? A wrote an encoder which sits right on top of the wire transports, takes whatever is in the body of the message and just throws the, em the envelope away puts the rest on the, on the wire. If it happens that the, 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 XML, the XML element inside the message is a base64 binary element, I'm taking the binary out and I'm putting the binary onto the wire. Mind that the Indigo message has an XML reader inside of it. There's a technique that I'm going to document in my blog how you can 
take that XML reader and layer that XML reader over an existing network screen. I can't because I'm, this is actually a TV application and I'm writing for myself to make, so I'm moving to America, right? <laughs> football, without football, no go. My dad is gonna get two things. He's gonna get my PC with three TV tuners in it. And he's gonna get a DSL line with 512 kilobit upstream. And he's gonna get an application which I'm currently writing <laughs> which will allow me to watch all 35 cable channels from Media Center at home in America. All 35 German channels. That's the application I'm currently building. Everything, all of that stuff, every single bit goes through my application, including the video streams. And all of that goes through video channels, except the pure video streams, but I'm still figuring out a method to do this. If I'm downloading and recording, right? which there will be an automated scheduler and all of this, I will have an automated, I will actually, com I will actually have the ability to comp compose the home TV from all those channels into a continuously running program that runs at home. So, if I'm, so when, when I, once I'm downloading the content, I can pull a two, four gigabyte or eight gigabyte large MPEG file through a single Indigo message and only have a footprint, a memory footprint of that message at any given point in time of, max, of a max of two megs. Because Indigo messages are streamed and they have streaming capabilities. So we have QA, streaming, RPC, HTTP, TCP, all in the same programming model. All the things that I, that I just showed you, all the complication that I have to build up is gone. It's a, it's a unification of everything that's networked. If you want to build a, an, a protocol, a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, right? A contract that is a callback contract for itself. That's something that's that duplex connections that I have that I don't have the time to show you. Use the peer net binding, which is a peer-to-peer -peer implementation right in the product. And there you have your peer-to-peer -peer network. Everything that's peer-to-peer -peer functionality is done in, you can write a peer-to-peer -peer network application in five minutes. That's as, power, uh, that's as powerful as this stuff is. This is the realization of service and orientation. And because of the service oriented principles, because of the restrictions that we're imposing on ourselves, the same restrictions that I, just, that I gave you during this, these two days, where I said, don't put reference, don't, there's no margin of RF object. There's none of these things, there's pure data. Right? There's data referenced in this way. There's data, data declared in, in, in this way. All the things that we showed you. Because of these restrictions, because of the way service-oriented applications are built, because of the tolerance, because of all those things, the people at, at Microsoft were able to build this thing. And it's an amazing piece of work. Because it makes it really, really, really simple to build those apps. The only thing that, that changed in the user experience here is that and I was able to, ex to expose the programming model due to, this, due to the, the, um, uh, the simplicity of this programming model. Look at the web server. I was able to put this here, right? I'm writing that. And these are just test messages. The one that's actually being called is get, right? It gets a message in, it puts a message out, and how is the dispatching done? I'm, I'm actually changing the dispatch mode of Indigo. I mean, I'm going as far to say, if there's any request with an HTTP GET on the root, meaning anywhere on the root, <coughs> this method is being called, and this takes whatever file it finds. Where's the GET? It's very easy. It takes whatever file it finds, and just creates a message, and that's the helper method that I've written. It creates a message around story around that file, create file reply message, and just returns that message. And the rest, Indigo is doing half of the work, my stuff is doing half of the work, but it's so extensible that that was very easy for me to write. The first prototype of getting arbitrary stuff on the wire, that was a day. Right? And I'm currently documenting this all on my blog. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can basically take that code, copy it down from my blog. I'm going to have a downloadable set of 
uh, an assembly that's called the New Intelligence Service Model Extensions that will give you the entire Pox, Pox REST capabilities right out of the box. So you can write web servers, you can return o RSS, you own OPML, whatever you like. Uh, my, my TV application here writes another interesting XML format that's called ASX, the Advanced Windows Streaming Format. Did you know that ASX is actually XML? It is. So because that's, because that's XML, uh, you can uh, create those ASX files yourself, you can control playlists from the server, you can do digital media and all those things uh, using those applications. It is amazing stuff. So I would encourage you to look at Indigo, um, to watch not only my blog, but uh, blogs of uh, people who are talking about it. Uh, WCF is the, the marketing official name. Everybody hates it. Um, so you would have to, for a while, you will have to search for, yeah, we'll have to MSN search for, <laughs> you have to move for um, uh, Indigo and or WCF to find information. But well, that stuff really rocks the world. And all the complication that I've, that I've been explaining and that I had to build, it's gone. Right? If it's MSN Q, your transport, just go use it. If it's TCP is your transport, just use it. So that's really, really cool. So, huh, I'm already 15 minutes over time, so I don't want to expand this because, because Atom is already totally nervous, and so am I. <laughs> HTTP staff staff.newintelligence.com slash Clements B. Oh, yeah, it's not that. Sorry. Well, .com works too, but the center address is .net. And Achim is Achimbo at newintelligence.com, and I am Clemens V at newintelligence.com for the time being. Uh, if Achim and Bart are nice to me, they will let me keep my intelligence address, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all that uh, email. They may be maybe getting tired of all the spam that I'm getting, which is you know, probably 2,500, 3,000 messages a day. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not kidding. Um, and uh, but send me email. All right, if you have any follow-up follow questions, go to my blog. There's going to be more of that. that I'm going to explain a lot of things in, in, in January, and also in, in so in February. I'm going to be explaining a lot of things, and then going forward, uh, my blog address is going to be as as the plans are going to be stable. Um, it doesn't really matter if you use that or what will be the new address, and that's going to be that, right? So it's going to be friends at intelligence.net, and my good friend Steve Swartz, who's uh, one of the key architects of Indigo, is going to join me at friends.intelligence.net. So his new blog is going to be friends.intelligence.net slash Steve, uh, Steve SW. The reason for that is that we want to build some balance to the force, for plural site. Uh, who is another great consulting outfit, and Don Box is, blog is blogging at the parole side side, and so Steve and I thought we're going to blog at the intelligence side, which is just, you know, fair. Um, so, uh, that's all, folks. I hope you uh, enjoyed the, the ride. Um, it's a difficult, it's, oops. See, I already want to go. I'm very uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy that uh, you all stayed. Uh, some didn't, and that's their own damage, right? Uh, and uh, Yossi and Elias allowing, and my new boss allowing, which we'll figure out. I'll be back uh, for TechEd. Um, and the main reason for that is that I am not going to miss the party. <laughs> because, because that, see, Don is not such a party, yeah, but no, he's no, such no, a party no. guy. I am. So, 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 Tech Ed Israel party, that's one of my personal goals. I know you're in Last year, damn. That was that was great fun. So you know, I don't care too much about the conference, but <laughs> 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 the party was great.